Button. We are going live on Facebook today. Steve, what's up, dude? What is up, my man? Okay, San Diego Real Estate, the ultimate insider's game. Ah, I love it. That's what we're talking about today. That we got a couple things: the Airbnb um, ruling yes. in San Diego, which could have a cascading effect on Absolutely. the marketplace. Absolutely. And I believe some point recently, off camera, you said that I was right about. <laughs> Uh, pretty There's, much everything I've ever said. I don't think uh, this we've was ever on. conversed about. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's me rounding. I'm rounding it up. That's, I can see. Yeah, round. It's you've got some ways to go, but I like where your head's at. There's okay. that's kind of the feature of the rounding. So before we, before we talk about how it's an insider's game and essentially what goes on, um, actually let's let's start there because we were out to dinner uh, with our wives. And I had done Listed Live that day. That's right. I saw this home and I said, man, I saw this home today, for example, that was this. And you were like, oh, I have someone who's looking for that. You need to make the connection. And within minutes, we had that done. I mean, at dinner, yeah. in front of the wives, <laughs> we had that deal done. Hang on, sweetheart. Let me work on this. <laughs> well, you were going to get in the property the next day. And um, yes. Before it hit the MLS. And, that, and there is a couple of main features there on why it's so good. And we'll talk about the insider's game to it. Both agents look good in that situation. You put us together because of the list at live, because of all the inside scoop that you've got. You put two agents together and said, hey, I, you have a property, you have a need, you guys should meet. What's wonder, we didn't write an offer on that property. That property was not a good fit. But what's nice about it is I'm able to show my clients up front, hey, I'm in the game. Mm -hmm. I'm looking not, ju I'm not just sitting around like every other person, every, not every, everybody that does or does not have a license can pull up the Redfins and the Zillows and the different sites and see a property when it hits an MLS. The advantage of what we call the insider's game is the ability to see stuff prior to it hitting the market. Um, and it's good for both, and it's good for the listing agent as well, because then he's able to say, look, I, because of the things that I've done, I had it on this listed live, and I have a relationship with Derek Evans, and he put me in contact with a potential buyer is walking through the door. Mm -hmm. Especially with what's happening in the market, that's such a valuable experience. So there's, there definitely is this piece of um, wor the, the benefits of, of working with an agent that has a good reputation and that works well with other agents. I think you said it best when you said in the game. Yeah. That's the hustle. The right. game is the hustle. Okay. I mean, so the hustle is like, it's like a 24 7 game pretty much. There are very few days off in your world, I know. Um, and that can always, that can be tough for the wives to understand that sometimes. Luckily, right? I was a realtor before I got in a relationship, <laughs> so she, she no, saw it early. Yeah. So, it, it, but, but that's part of the game. Right. The, the part of the hustle is that you don't know when that's going to happen. That happened at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night or something right. like that. And we were contacting the other agent. And the other agent, also in the game, also in the hustle, was there doing the same thing. Absolutely. So, you know, that, that's the insider's part of the game is that when you have a need, a lot, a lot of people are relying a little too much on the technology, I think, especially, well, bu both buyers and sellers, frankly, but definitely buyers. They're only looking at what's out there. Right. Like, oh, this is well, this is what's for sale. This is what's on the shelf. Yeah, but what's in the back? I mean, when you go into Walmart and they don't have what you want on the shelf, don't you ask someone like, "Hey, do you guys have anything in the back?" Yeah. Or like, you go there and I'm you at see, In and Out. Is there a secret menu? Is there anything <laughs> I need to know about? Yeah. Ask, that's what you should do. Ask your realtor. Hey, is there a secret menu? Is there anything I need to know about? You it's know, it's true though. I, th it is true, and, and a common question that I get, and of course. Something that I hear is, well, people will say, well, of course, you've got to move forward with the best offer, whether you like the agent or whether you don't like the agent or whether you have a relationship with them. Yes, I agree with that. You always end. We will advise our clients, this is the best offer. I don't care. If we're in a multiple offer situation and I'm BFFs with one of the agents and they're at 500,000 VA and we've got a 550 cash, I don't care how close we are, money talks. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's something that I have learned, and it's kind of big. I just want to prepare you. You ready? Realtors are liars. I know. It's, it's groundbreaking. It really is. I'm going to have to do the whole segment myself. <laughs> now, and not in the way that, 
like the house is sliding down the hill and realtors are saying, oh, it's okay. Kind of, I mean, there is failure to disclosure, but those are major lawsuits. But here's the lie that I hear every day, which is I tend to represent sellers. And an agent will write an offer, and they will say, <clears throat> Steve, these are the greatest people. They're so well qualified. They love this house. Yes, we've written offers on a couple of different properties, and we just, we just can't crack into this market. These people are such good people. Steve, this is going to be, my favorite words, the easiest transaction of your entire life. <laughs> and you know what? That's a lot. <laughs> it is not going to be the easiest transaction of my life because two weeks from now when you get your home inspection, then they, those same people write the letter that says, well, actually, we hate your house. We think it's absolute dog shit, but we're willing to move forward with it if you can drop the price $30,000 and send us a credit of $8,000 and can you throw in a birthday cake and all your personal property. And so inevitably what happens is that sellers feel totally baited and switched so bringing us back around, the point is, if, if you're an agent and you and I have a relationship and you are going to write an offer on the property, I know you don't want to hurt our relationship. You don't want to submit a request for repairs down the line. You don't want to lie to me and say, hey, we're not writing offers on other properties when really you are just to fall out of escrow two weeks later. That hurts our relationship. Mm -hmm. So the insider's game is not only very useful for those off-market opportunities, to which there, there are many. There really are. Um, and most listing agents, most agents that are representing sellers, people aren't calling them up and saying, come out and put it on the market right now, this second. People are calling them up and saying, I want to list my house. Let's talk about numbers. Let's talk about a variety of different things. But there is a lead time before that house actually hits the market. And what someone does in that lead time is where the networking and the I want to help you get a good deal can happen. Um, you made a big point there I don't want to get too far away from, which is that there really, it really is sort of a, a disadvantageous position to be in when you're the seller because you can't accept multiple offers and say, well, let's see which one he gets to the finish line first. Absolutely. You know? like, like that would be, that's essentially what the buy side has. So they can get out all, you have to stop taking offers and all these things, stop marketing your property while you're in escrow or while you have an accepted offer. Meanwhile, that buyer isn't committed yet. Absolutely. So there's a, there's a big disadvantage. That, like In other words, picking the right buyer is super crucial. And it's, it's super crucial. It's not easy um, just because there are so many different factors that go into it. A contingent buyer, a buyer that's selling their house, well, they need to sell that house. So in most people's minds, that would be a weaker offer because they need to sell a house. But if that house is in escrow with a good buyer, they need somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. So they're a very motivated buyer because otherwise in three weeks or whenever their house closes, they're going to be homeless. So that makes them a very strong buyer. Um, so there is that that very funny balance, but as, as we talked about before, at least what's happened in, the, in our previous market, which is in our market three months ago, as the market has cha is changing every day, um, and I think sellers really need to be aware of it, but... We'll talk about that in just a second. <laughs> Let me make a little... Roll note. the tape. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but inevitably what's happening is that a lot of buyers are giving up everything to get into escrow and they're waiving appraisal contingencies and paying over asking price and saying it's as is and yes, we'll do a quick close. And by the way, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, you can stay in the property and rent it back for 30 days. Yes, 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 yes. And then they get into the, then they win the property because they, their agent is promising the world, this will be the easiest transaction you've ever done. And then you get into escrow and they've got this contingency period that they can think about it. They're in the driver's seat at that point. And now they're in the driver's seat. And now the power shifts. And so exactly to your point, look at us coming around. We've agreed. We're slowly. As soon as you started agreeing with me, everything got easier. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about pre-listing inspections while we're on that? 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm a big fan of SD Home Inspect. They do a very thorough, uh, Philippe, they do a great job. And this isn't a pitch for them, but what I love about it is, and I do it on my listings 100% of the time. Uh, well, I can't say 100% of the time, but it's something that I highly, highly recommend. 
The reason being that then when the buyer is writing the offer, we're able to present the inspection report and say, here's the deal. Write your offer. Let's negotiate repairs right now. You've got the inspection report, and it's an extremely thorough one. Theirs are always like literally 100 pages long. Mm -hmm. So go through it. Yeah. Look through it. And then you want to make your offer strong? Tell us that you're writing your offer based on that inspection report. Now, they still have, the buyer still has their right in order to do their own home inspection, but if the home inspector, and they don't have something to know, they don't have a fiduciary relationship with the inspector because the inspector wasn't hired by the buyer, so if there was some negligence or anything like that, they, don't, they can't go after somebody that they didn't hire. Um, but that's, to me, that's the strong offer, is the offer that says, we've read through the inspection report, and we know you're listed at 500000 but we think the real value, based on what's needed, is more like four ninety two. So here's four ninety two with a request for repairs that says we'll take it as is and we're waiving our, our rights to, a, to any repairs. That's a strong offer. That's a strong offer. But that, there's a few things that have to happen in order to do that. You have to get the pre-listing inspection. You've got to get the pre-listing inspection. And then they have to make the offer based on that. Absolutely. And many times a buyer will feel like, um, I'm, I want to process this. I want to think about this. I want to have days to go through it, and rightly so. That's what, I, that's what I love about, I can only speak intelligently about California real estate, but that's what I like about the contract, is it a buyer is not making a decision based on walking through it one time. They can walk through it 17 times and then go, okay, yep, I, I like it. Should a buyer's agent be asking for that? So say, hey, did you have, do you guys have a pre-listing inspection Absolutely. that I can make an offer based on? Questions that a buyer's agent should ask. Do you have any inspection report? Did you represent the buyer, the seller, when they purchased the property? If so, and it was 10 years ago, do you still have that inspection report? I'd be interested in having that inspection report. I always recommend to every seller, if I represented them, or if not, hey, do you have your inspection report from when you purchased? And funny, sometimes people say, yeah, I actually do have it. It's handwritten out because it was so long ago. That's good information. Helps us get an idea of we're trying to build a background, a history on the property. So that's item number one. Um, I'll let many times ask if they have the disclosures. We do the disclosures up front. So when we're submitting the counter offer or, hey, you're going to write the offer, look through the disclosures. Here's what you know. There's a fraternity that lives next door, and they party hard every Friday night. <laughs> now you know. Now, it's not, now we don't go into escrow, and then all of a sudden that comes out on two weeks down the line, and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. That's Not just every Friday night. We found out it was every night. <laughs> every you night. lie, Steve. You lie. Um, other things a buyer's <laughs> agent should ask for, they should ask for the existence of other offers, and they should ask if the seller is representing any of those offers. How honest does a listing agent have to be with buyer's agents that are asking about offers? Well, if they're asked a direct question and they lie, then that's bad news. And what I would recommend is put it in writing. So ask, hey, because most agents, they will call t for a check-in. Hey, my client was interested. Let me take the temperature. You got 16 offers? Like, what's going on over there? Oh, we do have a couple of offers. Then what I always do is I send an email that says, Hey, Derek, pleasure to talk to you. I will let my clients know that, as you said, you have two offers. As you, per our conversation, you don't have any offers, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the end, in some cases where we see that when things were really wacky, people would write escalation clauses where they would say, I'll beat any other offer up to a million dollars by a thousand dollars. I'll beat any other offer by a thousand dollars up to a million dollars is the more proper English. Um, and I've had that in a few rare cases where people write that, and I always say, with, we got to put in with proof of the other offer, because otherwise you just, you're twisting. Totally. You're just so. wide open there. Um, there I, I think, so we've, we've started to see sort of a shift a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Right? Um, there's definitely been a shift. Tell me what you've seen in that shift. And Erica, what's up? We will, uh, <clears throat> let's see, what did she say? She said, right, that's an agent who knows what he's doing. I see you, Erica. Proactive versus reactive. We put the wide shot camera right where I can't see the comments. What's up, she Erica? She basically says, what's up, Steve? Steve is right. What's up, Erica? <laughs> um, so explain what you're seeing and why you have started to agree with me. I'm, I don't like the way you phrase that. <laughs> that, there is a, that there might be some headwind. There's some headwinds here. There's, there's a couple things that are there necessarily are, working. There closer. are things that are changing. 
Um, absolutely. And as we talked about off camera a little bit before, is that I, I went this morning to kind of a, a marketing session that talked about what's happening in the market. And the guy said something I liked, which he said, if you're pulling any reports today, July 26th, um, that's going to be based on June numbers. Well, June number, which are going to be June sales. June, June sales. sales aren't going to be, those are, that's going to be buyer activity from like March and April, from when they were looking then, writing offers then, getting accepted, going into escrow in, what month is before June? May. Whew, that was tough. So it's a, it's a new snapshot. So if a property sells in June, that's a, that's a really good temperature taker of what was happening in March. Now you're talking July, almost August. We're five months, that's, that's a whole lifetime away. Um, so what's happening? Increasing inventory. A lot more sellers coming on the market. Um, and year over year, we've seen more inventory in every price point um, in San Diego County. San Diego County listings are up 20%. Actually, I think the real number is like 19.2% um, year over year of last year. And, are you, are you fact checking me here? No, I'm, uh, I'm gonna pull up so you can see like just what we're actually looking at in San Diego Yeah. Uh, as far as listings are concerned. Because um, there, there definitely have been, and I'm gonna look here, I don't think I have any of these filters on. Well, um, you do that, Erica and I will just chat back and forth. You and Erica chat while I work here. Um, so, <laughs> actually, no, it's, it's having trouble refreshing right now. Um, but what, what you noticed is basically, or at least what I noticed is, see, I was doing some weird stuff here. Yeah, I, I, we can't rely on this right now. It's definitely not acting appropriately. It's because it's agreeing with me? No, <laughs> it's stuck in this search range of 125 to 15 million and I'm trying to say no min and no max but it's just not listening. Um, maybe, maybe if I do it this way it'll work. What I was going to try to show is basically that we have a tremendous amount of homes in the market. Absolutely. Um, as far as what we're used to seeing and I think I got it fixed here. So uh, now this one's saying there's 2,500 homes. Um, these are all detached and within you know the, uh, the area that I'm looking at but you can see there's just there's just big numbers. Yeah. You know, there's lots and lots of homes for sale. Um, and when you drill into any area, let's, let's take a look at Vista since Steve's here. How about that? Let's do it. As long as the, as long as the computer isn't upset with me, because it seems to be right now. So there's Vista. Okay. Yeah. Drill in a little bit, and you start to see, like, that's a lot of homes for sale. Absolutely. And year over year, it's a lot of homes for sale. And here's what's happening is that every day as prices, now it's, it hasn't shifted to a buyer's market. It still is a seller's market, but it's not wacky. And in some of the areas where things don't fly off the market immediately, like Vista, um, we're beginning to see, it, it used to be, used to be being five months ago, we'll say, that if there was a sale that was at 600,000 and you walked into a listing presentation that you would tell that person, oh, I think 625, and they would say, oh, how about 649? And wow. you'd go, okay, now what you really should do is you should list it in line with the comps. If a property sold six months ago at 600000 you need to list your property at 600000 That's 599 Secret, you can keep that one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, do we have a pen? Is there a pen that I can <laughs> write some of this? He's just <laughs> dropping gems over here. I got gems everywhere. So, and, and on top of that, what we're seeing is we're seeing buyers, every time there is a new price point or a new jump in the interest rate, there is always a little pullback. There's always a little, ooh, I need to think about that. And then it becomes the new normal. What we're seeing in this market, the market being today, is that buyers are getting more sticky. And they're saying, I'm not paying over what the comp, that my most recent comp sold Which is at. just regular sanity you know like that's just <clears throat> so yes to your point more, another gem another Derek Evans gem buyers are getting more sane they're becoming more sane um, but you, <laughs> you look at some of these homes now um, there are there are hot homes here this is one of the cool things um, about the Redfin site for looking at properties is that you kind of show you like hey these are some of the houses that uh, a lot of people are looking at but you can see look where the hot home price ranges are 589 yeah. 545 
520, 575, 550. So this shows you where the buyers are really looking a Absolutely. lot. 589, all sub 600. Yeah. So what, what gets really scary is if you take this guy and you say, well, let's look at million plus. And look at that, three homes. Oh yeah. Yeah, but wait until we get, look at this. Yeah. Um, yeah they don't really let you get a full scope anymore. You used to be able to kind of zoom out and see the whole county. Look at how many million plus homes there are for sale. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there, there are so many. They're all over the place and they're all on top of one another. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think Usually, you know, the, the high end market's sort of a leading indicator. I mean, typically it points us in the direction, you know, um, although we've seen on the super, super high end, there's been way more activity this year. Um, that I think it's homes over 8 million. We've had 18 sold in San Diego so far this year, which is all we had in all of last year. Uh, but that is a sign of, I think, a great economy. Right. An actual great economy. And, that's, and that was in the... The, this morning, in order to in interrupting you, wages are strong. And so the big question that everybody always asks is, what's going to happen? And nobody has a crystal ball, but with wages so strong and employment so strong and things that are happening economically, um, there is going to be an adjustment. And to your point, the adjustment this time is going to be different than the last one. But the lending is far more conservative. Although we are seeing some stated stuff come back, there is some I don't want to say weird programs, but some of those They creative. make a lot more sense, though. They right. make a lot more sense than, than they had in the past because they're more equity-driven. Absolutely. Down payment driven, yeah. which makes sense. But this is just, uh, you know, and, and here we're kind of looking at Rancho Santa Fe and stuff like that. So, of course, there's going to be a million plus, you know, dollar homes. But, I mean, it's just... Yeah, but there's Carmel Valley. Look, everywhere yeah. we go, it doesn't matter where I go, they're, they're, you know, we're littered with these million plus dollar listings. Some of them even hot here in Carmel Valley hot homes at one plus million dollars. So it starts to just get, you know, it starts to be a little a little crazy when you have this many million plus dollar homes on the market, no matter really what area, you know, you're looking in. This is just a lot. Yeah. So, uh, which is fine. You know, some of these homes are probably good deals even, you know, that might right. be one, two, or one, three. Um, but they're just a lot. Yeah. And so um, we've seen that really slow down, like the million and a half plus homes really like it's almost a screeching halt right now. Absolutely. So um, I don't think that should really, I don't think that's, I'm not saying there's a, any kind of crash or anything like that happening. What I'm saying is that the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a gap between the bid and the ask. Yes, there's ebb and flow. But yeah, there's a gap. Right. Sellers want this, buyers are willing to pay this, and when you have that gap, it's a matter of who's going to give first. My guess is that the sellers will have to give this time depending on their motivation as well. I think that for a long time there has been sellers that will say, if my neighbor can get this, then I'm willing to list it if I can get that same price. So I'm not truly kind of a make me move kind of price. But as buyers get, or excuse me, as sellers get more motivated, absolutely. We're gonna see people, it, I have had in the past where sellers have said, I wanna hold firm to my price for my neighbors for my neighborhood. And I've got a lot more sellers recently that are like, screw my neighbors. I want my money and I want to move on. <laughs> I'll take my money. Yeah, I'll just, thank you very much. I'll take my money. Suckers! Yeah. <laughs> so we've been waiting for a catalyst though, right? Absolutely. We've been saying, like, hey, what, what's it going to be? So interest rates went up and, ha and have continued to kind of go up a little bit. Yeah. Um, nothing drastic, but enough to move the meter a little bit. So that being the case, could that be the thing? Yeah, maybe that creates a little bit of separation because now the buyers are going, hey, this is now really stretching it for me. So I got to kind of go on the low range here. Uh, that could be it. But then we had in the city of San Diego, at least, um, you know, this ruling on vacation rentals, which was a really big deal, seeing that it needs to be you know, a primary residence, and that's going to mess up. It's going to it's going to muck up things a little bit down in the PB Mission Beach Absolutely. area. I think it'll impact values. Definitely, and so now it just I think it really just depends on whether the market continues to believe that that is the prime spot, you know, for coastal real estate or not, or one of the prime spots, um, because if you look in PB, okay, there's a lot of difference between the, the different coasts. But in PB, typically what you see, especially coastal PB, is like 
not not as good of construction, not as nice of homes as you would see in like a La Jolla right. or a Del Mar. Um, you know, stuff's a little bit smaller, a um, little bit more cheaply constructed, a lot of older things, but still 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.4, 5 million dollar homes all over the place. Right. Was the justification for those prices based on these Airbnb, you know, conversions? And if it was, and that's going to go away, then if we take a two or three or four hundred thousand dollar hit on a property in Pacific Beach, does that translate elsewhere right. or not? That's the big question because this could be the first domino. The, the San Diego market, in my opinion, is so unique in that it is so. There are so many different local markets. The, the community that you live in in Del Mar is very, very different than the community that I live in in Vista, and not just because of geography and topography and. Um, but the demographics are different. The schools are different. Um, and the real estate trends are different in each of them. So in my opinion, no. If, a, if the Pacific Beach domino falls, it doesn't hit anything, although it may impact some of that surrounding area, the Ocean Beach. But even La Jolla, which is one city north, is not impacted, my opinion. You don't think so? I don't think so. Because, the, because even though it's a very similar coastline, it's the same climate, it's a very different community. It's a very different, um, it's a very different home that's there. True. And we're looking here at uh, Pacific Beach. This is the 92109 area. So this is really Mission Beach. Um, but you can kind of see some of these price points and stuff like that, some of these homes that are, that are out there. And, you know, I don't know how you... you when you get to a certain price point, like how do you price, you know, a house? Yeah, what's the difference between a ten million and a thirteen million? Yeah. When there hasn't been any sales or when you have a very unique home? Do you know what I mean? Now here's a one bedroom, one bath for a million bucks. Now you tell me that price is not it was a short sale, is not based upon or we didn't get that far to a million bucks without there being, you know, that vacation rental hotel element. Absolutely. That's a short sale. Yeah. So that's interesting. Right next to that is that a one bedroom, one bath for one point four. For one point four. Yeah. So right, yeah, really right next to it. Um, so one bedroom, one point four. You tell me, how in the world do we get to that number if we're being sane or if we're not, you know, using these these crazy calculations of what I'm going to do as a vacation rental, I'm going to charge hotel rates, and it's going to be full every night, and look how much money you can make, and okay, it's worth one point four. I agree that some of those numbers get hard to stomach. And I don't want to say don't make sense, but the demographic that's going to buy a I'll one bedroom. I'll say it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, the demographic that's going to buy a one bedroom um, is a single person, typically, or husband and wife that are really good problem solvers and never fight, um, but not any kids or animals or anything like that. Um, and at the one that you just showed at 1.4, um, that requires a significant down payment in order to make those numbers work. I mean, you can put $300,000 down and you're still looking at a $1.1 million loan. Um, so I agree that for those specific types of property, Airbnb is going to greatly impact them. The issue is that most coastal condos that are of that size don't allow, because of the HOA, they don't allow Airbnbs anyways. Um, so the change with the Airbnb will drastically imp Not impact. Not a lot of HOAs in PB, though. Yeah, no, that's what I'm going to say. It's going to drastically impact PB um, and OB and some of those other communities. Oceanside, Carlsbad, not going to be as impacted. Well, they're not, they don't have to comply because they're not Correct. in the city of San Diego. Oh, you really got to call me out? Yeah. On, on the so you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> you're, oh, cor you're correct for the first time. <laughs> yeah, Carlsbad, Encinitas, Oceanside, not affected by this rule directly. What right. I was saying was that by proxy, right. they could be if we're because looking at... Because of the domino effect. Yeah, because like, you know, I used to look and, and I, I called this and gosh dang it. So one thing I, I really didn't take action on, I really wanted to take action on and I didn't, was Ocean or, uh, Oceanside in 20... Um, 14, 2013, 2014, Oceanside was calling Oceanside, hey, this is going to be the spot. You know, like, 
buy an Oceanside. This makes so much sense. It makes no, no sense why it's half the price you know, of Carlsbad. It makes no sense. And of course, it doubled since. I didn't buy like an idiot. Um, but I was comparing it to the other coastal areas right. and saying, well, you know, it's a better deal up here. It's a, it's a much, much better deal if you just look at this. So the question is, are, we, are people going to still con want to see a better deal in Oceanside and Carlsbad? Because I think this, that's definitely not the case in Carlsbad. Carlsbad, there's actually a lot of homes there that are at a premium yeah. to even Encinitas. Absolutely. And that, to me, honestly, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why not? Because I like Encinitas way better. <laughs> and, and I think most, peop <laughs> most people would answer the same way. But the... But why? Why do you like Encinitas better than Carlsbad? Is, do you like the downtown? Do you like the schools? Do you like the commute to downtown? Yeah, yeah less traffic. A lot okay. less traffic. A, a lot less is like 10 minutes worth of less traffic. No, it's a lot less, bro. <laughs> 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 if I, <laughs> like, during a traffic time, getting yes. all the way up to Carlsbad takes way more than 10 minutes. Well, you're talking going northbound. Yes. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. That yes, when at Friday at 4 o'clock, that if you're in 92024 and you're trying to get from Encinitas Boulevard to Poinsettia, that that's more than 10 minutes. I will agree. Let's, let's uh, address Chris's uh, question here. Can you read it? Because I can't see it. Do you have any question. information or insight on the Dodd-Frank regulations on lending and status of those changes on lending and home sales? What are your opinions on the rollbacks of these regulations? Yeah, the rollbacks of the regulations um, are, uh, here's the thing, it's just like a pendulum swinging, you know, like there's over-regulated, under-regulated, then over-regulated, and now kind of going, okay, we went a little too far. Um, also, you have different, you know, administration involved that's wants a little bit less regulation. So, yeah, I would expect a lot of that stuff to roll back. The biggest thing that they did in Dodd-Frank was that they made it easier for banks to make more money and take less risk. That was really, that's why it was such a scam. Ultimately, they hit it at, you know, they, under the guise of we're going to make things safer for consumers. They make anything safer. Let me ask you this. If I give you 10 more pieces of legal size paperwork, does that make it safer for you as a consumer when you're buying a house? You already have 100 pages to sign. doesn't make any freaking safer. Uh, but they, they, they did under the guise of that. And what really is happening, Chris, is they, are, they have set that all up so that they could make sure that no more loan officers were cowboys, no more 1099s, no more you know, owning your own mortgage company, none of that stuff. You're going to have to work for a mortgage bank who's going to sell their proper loans to the big banks who are going to make the real money, you know, on the secondary market. So uh, the rollback of that would be good, I think, for everyone um, except for maybe the big banks. So unlikely it'll happen. But, uh, but good question. And we are live here on Facebook, obviously. If you want to share this video, that's great. If you would like to ask us questions or chime in and give a comment, that's great. Um, so that, that's really the question. So when we look at this little thing right here, this $1.4 million one bedroom, one bathroom that's on the market, I'm not going to pull up any details. I don't want to call out anybody, but um, it's 825 Portsmouth Court. Um, so it's uh, <laughs> like you just look at these and you go, there's only one way yeah. that it makes sense that this two bedroom, one bathroom, 700 square foot home could possibly, conceivably, be a decent deal at 1.7 million. And of course, I mean, looking at the map, you can look at the topography of the available land that there is mm -hmm. and the available and the proximity to the bay and the ocean and these kinds of things. So very limited supply there of land. And I think it would be very interesting to get an opinion on what's the value of the land and what's the value of the structure. A, that structure that is in the upper left-hand corner there, that whatever it was, two-bedroom, one-bath for 1.7, that okay. structure is probably worth 250000 Okay. The, and the remainder is... is the is, lot. Is the lot. Is the ability to look... Maybe go... To look straight ahead and see the ocean, to look to your left and see the bay, and look to your right, and you can peek the Atlantic o Ocean if you look... Just, get just high enough. the rubber neck it, yes, but if you but uh, yeah you're correct and if you have the ability to build up that also has value Absolutely. no There's question value no question no doubt but that much you know well and that's I mean because you're gonna have to spend some money to take advantage of that and then where are you at price price point wise absolutely you know so um, and what what should an oceanfront property in this area be worth. And so, uh, and I'm not trying to pick on, on PB here. This just happens to be the place where this leg new legislation is going to affect the most. Absolutely. 
and 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 the real question is will it cascade out you know will that f fly inward to, and hit Bay Park will that go north a little bit and ding La Jolla or Del Mar or Encinitas will it um, I don't think so I and, don't know and in my opinion as, as much as we talk about what's happening in the market and market time increasing and these in these differences this year is going to appreciate my opinion 2019 if you're buying right now it's still a good buy because next year is going to appreciate we have seen 2014 there was a huge there was like three or four months where the inventory increased and it was a ghost town and everybody felt like wait a second is this are we dipping again there is commonly ebb and flow and so don't think don't have a panic attack thinking the inventory is increasing and now I'm making a bad decision I as we've talked about with my old gray beard um, there are depending on the type of loan that you're in depending on the payment that you're in there are still and even with the tax changes there are still a lot of benefits to jumping into this market yeah yeah no question I, I'm not predicting anything downward being too drastic at least anytime soon there'll probably be pockets you know Absolutely. where we'll see it we've already seen a couple of areas where things have slowed down a little bit and no real huge comp bombs yet but I, I think they will come eventually we do have a very strong economy but the thing that's interesting is you know that a strong economy does not always correlate with Absolutely. a strong stock market or a strong real estate market for that matter yeah. I mean, we've had a strong stock market that has sort of carried the economy so the stock market was good, which sort of gave everyone the confidence to go, yeah, it's okay, let's keep doing what we're doing. And then yeah. we sort of faked it till we made it. Now we've made it, and the economy is actually good, but that means interest rates are going to naturally go higher. Right. Um, and that also means that there's going to be more competition and more things for the big companies who are part of those stock market indices to deal with. Right. You know, And when there become other investments that are sexier than the stock market, because the stock market essentially is traded like a commodity. It's like, do I want to be in stocks or do I not want to be in stocks? P.E. ratios and all that stuff is kind of out the window these days. It's like, who's investing on P.E. ratios? Does anyone even know what the P.E. ratio is of the S&P? It's crazy high, <laughs> okay? So if, if we were making bets on you know, where money would flow, I think we may see a stock market correction um, before we would see a real estate correction. I think we really could, yeah. and we could, and, and a strong economy during the whole thing. A strong economy during the entire process. That's something that's unique that we haven't seen before that I don't think people are expecting to see. I agree. Yeah, and and as you've talked about, it's going to be figuring out what is the catalyst. What is it that? What's the tipping point that makes a large group of demand, a large group of su supply, make some drastic change? I know the tipping point. I know what it is. It is Steve's wallet. Every time. <laughs> He's tipping the stage That's, right now. We, we actually have to the, angle the cameras. <laughs> Just a little bit. All right, great stuff, my friend. Steve Pletz, the one and only. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Pletz with the pea green shirt. Straight That's from P -E -A, 19. That's P-E-E, not P-E-E. <laughs> great stuff. Not like his P-E-E -E tie. <laughs> So, if you <laughs> thank you for tuning in. You're officially smarter than everyone else. If you would like to make your friends smarter than everyone else, please share this video. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time.